For generations, the formula for a better future seemed simple, intelligence and education. We believed it was the key to progress. But what if the data reveals a shocking twist? What if the very people who achieve this success are the ones disappearing from the gene pool? This isn't a theory. It's a statistical reality unfolding across the globe. Look at South Korea, a powerhouse of education. Their fertility rate just hit 0.78, the lowest number ever recorded for any country in human history. This raises a deeply unsettling question. Is our modern definition of success in direct conflict with our own survival? This isn't an isolated case. From the tech hubs of California to the historic capitals of Europe, the same story is repeating itself. The brightest, most driven individuals are stepping off the traditional path of parenthood. The paradox deepens when you examine the brutal economics of modern life. In the United States, the estimated cost to raise a single child to adulthood, not including college, is over $230,000. For many young professionals, that's not a price tag. It's a financial mountain range they must be willing to cross. And this number doesn't even account for the immense opportunity cost. The sacrifice promotions, the delayed career milestones, the entrepreneurial ventures never started because the risk became too great. Meanwhile, in many regions where educational and economic opportunities are far more scarce, larger families remain the vibrant, beating heart of society. This forces us to dig deeper. If it's not just about money and opportunity, then what is it? Is there a fundamental psychological shift that happens inside a mind that has been trained to analyze, optimize, and foresee risk? The answer lies buried deep in our own psychology, in the way our modern minds are trained to think. For insights, we can turn to the work of cognitive psychologists like Daniel Kahneman. Highly analytical minds don't just apply logic to their work. They apply rigorous cost-benefit analysis to life's biggest decisions, including having a child. On one side of this mental ledger, the costs are concrete and quantifiable. The financial burden, the loss of personal freedom, the sleepless nights, the career interruptions. On the other side, the benefits, love, purpose, joy, are emotionally profound but abstract and hard to measure. To a mind that prioritizes logic, the conclusion is often brutally clear. Having children appears to be an economically and logistically suboptimal decision. But the psychology goes deeper than just money. It's about risk. Higher cognitive ability often correlates with an increased awareness of potential dangers. Future parents can become saturated with child development research, hyper-aware of all the ways parenting can go wrong. This creates a paralyzing desire to be the perfect parent before even starting, a standard that is never truly achievable. Does this anxiety sound familiar? Finally, there's what we can call expanded opportunity awareness. For most of history, parenthood wasn't a choice, it was the default path to a meaningful life. Today, for many intelligent individuals, it is just one option on a vast menu of fulfilling possibilities. Becoming a world traveler, a dedicated artist, a groundbreaking entrepreneur, a political activist. When you can vividly envision dozens of ways to build a rich and meaningful life, choosing just one path requires a far more deliberate and often more difficult decision. But this very modern, very internal debate is actually the echo of a powerful concern raised over 150 years ago by the father of evolution himself. Charles Darwin himself grappled with this very possibility. More than a century and a half ago, he expressed a profound worry. What happens when an advanced society creates conditions where the very traits that benefit that civilization most become disconnected from reproductive success? Natural selection operates on a single ruthless metric, which traits get passed on to the next generation. It has no opinion on what a society happens to value, be it wisdom, compassion, or in this case, analytical intelligence. In pre-industrial societies, the link was direct and brutal. A more intelligent individual was a better hunter, a more effective farmer, or a savvier leader. These skills were directly tied to survival and therefore to having more offspring who also survived to reproductive age. But modern civilization has largely severed this connection. Today, a high IQ might help you earn a PhD or succeed on Wall Street, but the years of intense dedication required for these pursuits directly compete with family formation. The very trait that helps you win at the game of civilization might lead you to lose at the game of sheer replication. That is the paradox. History offers some intriguing, though complex, parallels. During the later Roman Empire, it's documented that educated, 
aristocratic families also tended to have fewer children. Of course, to blame Rome's decline solely on this single factor would be a gross oversimplification. It was a perfect storm of economic instability, political corruption, and external invasions. The pattern is simply a haunting note in a much larger symphony of collapse. Understanding this deep evolutionary challenge is critical, but it's a path lined with danger. And before we dare to discuss solutions, we must first confront the dark historical shadow that this topic inevitably casts. We must be crystal clear. Any discussion involving intelligence and reproduction risks being deliberately misused to justify the ugly and discredited ideology of eugenics. So let us be unequivocal. The research and the patterns we are discussing here do not, in any way, support such conclusions. Here's why. First, intelligence isn't some fixed genetic destiny. It is profoundly shaped by environmental factors. Nutrition, the quality of education, healthcare access, and early childhood stimulation. Second, the intelligence measured in most of these studies is a very narrow form of analytical skill. It doesn't capture creativity, emotional wisdom, or social intelligence, qualities that are equally, if not more, vital for human flourishing. And most importantly, as this entire analysis shows, the correlation between intelligence and fertility is not a biological law. It is a product of specific social and economic conditions. Conditions that we can understand, and more importantly, that we can change. Therefore, the only ethical response is not to control or judge anyone's personal choices, but to fix the societal problems that created this paradox in the first place. The good news is, we are not powerless against this trend. The solutions are not theoretical, they are practical, and in some parts of the world, they are already working. The key is to stop trying to change people's choices and start changing the environment that constrains those choices. First, we can see the proof in policy. Cross-national studies reveal a stunning fact. In countries with strong family support systems, the negative correlation between intelligence and fertility often shrinks or even reverses entirely. Look at Sweden. Fathers there receive 240 days of paid parental leave compared to zero federally mandated days in the US. Universal childcare is high quality and affordable. These policies fundamentally restructure the economics of parenthood, proving that when the conflict between career and family is reduced, this paradox can be solved. Second, beyond government policy, another powerful force is reshaping this landscape, technology, specifically artificial intelligence. Rather than some distant future, AI tools are already enabling the flexible work arrangements that make parenthood more feasible. Think of remote collaboration platforms that allow a parent to maintain career momentum, or smart home systems that can handle routine logistics like monitoring sleep patterns and managing schedules, reducing the daily exhaustion of modern parenting. Imagine AI tutors that democratize high-quality education, easing the pressure on parents to be constant intellectual stimulators. Technological change moves at lightning speed. These practical applications could make many of today's demographic concerns irrelevant within just a few decades. But policy and technology are only part of the equation. The final piece of the puzzle is culture. For too long, we've been told a story of competing priorities. Think about the messages you received growing up. Was parenthood presented as a partner to achievement or as an obstacle to it? We need a new narrative a culture that celebrates successful parent scholars and parent professionals. One that reframes the challenges of child rearing not as career limiting, but as an intellectually stimulating, emotionally enriching, and deeply valuable part of a flourishing life. Through smarter policy, empowering technology, and a more holistic culture, the conflict between intelligence and fertility isn't a destiny. It's a design problem waiting for us to solve. So, the apparent conflict between intelligence and fertility isn't a biological inevitability. It's a symptom of a society that makes career success and family life unnecessarily opposed. The real question was never about whether intelligent people should have more children. The real question is whether we want to live in a world that forces such a choice at all. Human flourishing depends on an incredible diversity of qualities. Wisdom, compassion, creativity, resilience, attributes that don't show up on any IQ test. The future isn't predetermined by current trends. We have the uniquely human ability to understand these deep forces and respond with intention. Rather than fearing demographic change, we can see it as an opportunity to build a better, wiser, and more humane society. 
But this conversation is far from over. In fact, the most important voices still haven't been heard, yours. So we leave you with this. If you could redesign one thing in our society to make pursuing your ambitions and building a family no longer feel like a painful conflict, what would be the very first thing you'd change? And why on earth haven't we done it yet? Drop your thoughts in the comments. This is where the Rayal conversation begins.